Well, you're here this morning because um, we're going to talk about the Best Family Ever Award. Welcome to the final meeting of our committee because we're in search of amazing families from the beginning of the world to now. And today is the day we're going to decide which family is going to receive this brand new award, fresh from the designer, the Best Family Ever Award. I think they've done very well, really, because they blend the subtle lines of an Oscar with a kind of simple family shape. And although solid gold was a bit beyond our budget, I think it looks quite nice in solid olive wood. It's kind of an example of family trees and growing and strength and being fruitful. So let's review our shortlist, our final shortlist, and explore some of the comments that have been made by our anonymous team of experts. Well, let's see, who did we have first? Adam and Eve, they're our first nominees. We thought they did very well to stay married for almost a thousand years and to work out how to have the first marriage ever without any books, any marriage retreats, any counselling. And they also had to survive the tragedy of one son's death and the other son's conviction for murder. But our reviewers weren't quite as positive as us. They said that they thought they had an unfair advantage because they didn't have any in-laws. And even worse, every problem that every family's ever had actually goes back to their first problem in the Garden of Eden. So they're responsible for every single family problem ever. So we really can't give them an award because they get the blame for everything. So better cross them off the list, I think. Who's next? Abraham and Sarah. Second on the list, Abraham and Sarah. We think they did a really good job, actually. They've been called the mother and father of Israel. But again, our very picky team of experts pointed out bit of a problem with them, especially the whole Hagar affair. And twice Abraham lied and put his wife at risk by letting her live in another man's harem, including once when she was probably pregnant with Isaac. And then the child protection expert pointed out that we really can't be seen to condone Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son, however good the reason. Fair point. Well, you better cross them off as well. Third on the list was Jacob and his family. Again, a great patriarch who fathered at least 12 sons and a daughter. Pretty good going. But our expert witnesses pointed out there were some serious flaws in this family too. Jacob had at least four wives, and we're trying to promote uh, committed monogamy here. And uh, singling one son out for special favors and giving him a fancy coat, it's never a very good positive parenting strategy. And then there was all that sibling rivalry amongst the sons. Appalling. Can you imagine? It was so bad. They saw their brother to be a slave. Then they lied to their dad and pretended for years that he was dead. Yes, there was a happy ending, but it was very messy along the way. Hmm. I guess they're right. Better cross them off as well. Who's next? David, David and. Well, that says it all, doesn't it, really? Uh, we thought this was quite hopeful. David is a man after God's own heart, after all. Surely he could be a winner. But let's see what they said. Well, David, yes. Um, too many wives. A bit hard to work out how many. And then there was the whole Bathsheba affair including plotting the death of her husband to cover up the whole mess. And then years later, look what happened to his children. They were involved in serious sibling rivalry, incest and murder. Definitely can't reward a family like that. Certainly not a good example. Do we have anyone else? Is anyone else out there? Oh. Yes, Mary and Joseph. Now, we thought they would be very high on the list because, after all, God chose them to parent his son. And they could take the pick of anyone in the whole wide world. And he chose Mary and Joseph. So they must have been really excellent parents. And actually, when you think about it, this ward probably looks a bit like them. So, but our super scrupulous reviewers even managed to find a serious problem in this family. Because they pointed out that any parents who lose track of their 12-year-old son for three days today probably be charged with neglect. Whatever reason the son gave and however good it was. And that's a bit of a shame, really, because I rather fancied giving them the award. So that's it, then. We don't actually have any other families left on the shortlist. Oh, no, here's another one. Just at the last minute, the latest nomination. It's who? Karen and Bernie Holford. Never heard of them. Something about Karen working as family ministers at the Trans-European Division. Huh, as if that makes a difference. Ah, oh, but there's a little post-it note here at the bottom. What does it, what does it say? It says... This couple is totally unsuitable. You should see how hard Karen bangs the kitchen cupboard doors when she's in a bad mood, and some of the hinges are broken. Once they had such a big row at the dinner table, their 15-year-old son had to remind them that they were grown-ups. 
and more recently, since Karen's joined the TUD, they hardly ever even go to the same church together. Mm, oh, there's much worse. Ooh, mm, mm. Better draw a discreet veil over that lot, though, because it's, uh, here we are on Sabbath morning. So I guess we can rule them off as well. It's very worrying. You think they would know better, actually. So that's it. Nobody else? Any more thoughts out there? Any other nominations for the best family ever? Shall I take your silence as a, a no? Does this mean there has never been a perfect family in the history of the world? So we made this beautiful award for nothing. That's a bit awkward, isn't it? Or have we? Maybe we've just been working with the wrong definition of what makes a good family. Because maybe in an imperfect world like ours, there are lots of really important things that God wants us to learn that we can only learn by living in an imperfect family. <clears throat> things that are really hard to experience if you live in a perfect family and everyone's perfect. I think I learned more about God's love from parenting my own children that they, than they ever learned from me. When one of them tipped a bowl of tomato spaghetti all over their head and all over the nice pale green carpet, I learned about God's patience with our messes. When one of them discovered how much fun it was to throw stones at a greenhouse and see how many panes of glass they could break, I learned about forgiveness and I learned about restoration. We had one baby who needed to be in constant physical contact with me 24 hours a day. And it was really tiring, but through that I learned that's how God wants to be with me, 24 hours a day, that close to me, always. And I learned that sometimes when our children mess up and make the worst mistakes ever, that's when I feel even more love for them, even more concern for them, and my heart just grows and bursts with love, even when they just completely mess up. And I think that's something like how God is. And we don't learn these things about God's love when everyone and everything is all nice and perfect. We also learn things about God in our marriage. Through my, hus through my marriage, Bernie's love for me has taught me all sorts of things about how Jesus loves the church and sacrifices for the church and gave himself up for her. Together we've learned what it means to be committed for now more than 33 years, through richer and poorer, for better, for worse, through chronic illness and vibrant health, and eventually, I guess, till death, do us part. One day when I bumped Bernie's car and I drove home, and he welcomed me with warmth and patience and total acceptance, I learned more about God's complete acceptance of me too. And when we cried together through life's tragedies, we learned how much God cares for us and comforts us in those tragedies too. So I wonder what these great patriarchs actually learnt through their imperfect family life. Let's revisit them and see what they might have learnt, and maybe you'll have other ideas. Adam and Eve. Well, I think they learnt very profoundly the deep and painful effect that selfishness and sin can have on a relationship. And to stay together for a thousand years nearly, they learnt about commitment and they must have learnt about forgiveness and how to comfort each other through the pain of life through the story of Cain and Abel and all that that meant to them. So I think they learnt a lot about God through the imperfection of their relationship. Then we have Abraham and Sarah. And they've learnt the importance of following God's instructions, that his way is the right way. Even though it sometimes takes a really long time to get there, we need to hang in there, trusting that God will do what he says, even when it seems humanly impossible. And then what about Jacob's family? What might they have learnt? I think eventually, Joseph learnt the importance of humility. And they learnt about God working his amazing plan through even the crazy mess that they created in their family life. And they learnt the importance of honesty and telling the truth. David, I wonder what he learnt. We know some of what he learnt in the amazing psalms he wrote following the, the tragic episode with Bathsheba and his understanding of how, much, how, how sinful he was and how much God could forgive even that sin. So David learnt about God's incredible forgiveness and his patience. And when God eventually gave them their son Solomon, he showed that God can bless us abundantly, even when we've messed up and sometimes when we least deserve it. So David learnt a lot about God through the imperfections in his family life. What about Mary and Joseph? Well, from the very beginning, this couple started out knowing how to trust God in very challenging situations. 
and how to depend on him for his guidance in their life. And when they lost Jesus for just a little while, I'm sure they realized how important it was to keep their eyes on him and to stay close to him. And so all these families, they've learned the importance of keeping their relationship with God strong as well as their relationship with each other. Because when we do this, it's much easier to protect our relationships from breaking and damage. And it's much easier to mend them when they do get chipped or when they begin to crack. Several centuries ago, there lived a Chinese emperor who really appreciated a lovely cup of tea. Maybe he wasn't Chinese, maybe he was actually British. But then one day, his beautifully painted porcelain teacup fell on the floor and broke. And he was devastated because this was his favorite teacup. And even though he probably owned a thousand more and could buy all the teacups in the world, this one was special. Maybe it was the one his wife gave him on their wedding day. So when it broke, he was so sad. And he called his court officials to him and said, I want this to be mended. Find a way to mend this cup because it's so precious to me. Well, his officials went away and they shook their heads because in China at that time, there was not a good way to mend porcelain. The way that they did it was clumsy and rough and ugly with gray metal. But these Chinese officials knew there were amazing craftsmen in Japan. So they sent the emperor's special teacup to the artisans in Japan and explained the situation. You can imagine what a challenge it was to be asked to mend the Chinese emperor's favorite teacup. So the Japanese artisans wondered what to do, and they probably also wondered what might happen to them if they didn't manage to do a good job. And they wondered, and they thought, this cup must be very precious to the emperor, because if it wasn't, he would just throw it away. So I wonder if we can mend it in a way that will make it even more precious. Maybe, they thought, maybe we can mend it with gold. Wow, what an amazing idea. That would look so beautiful. And when the emperor received his teacup, mended with a special alloy mixed with gold, he was delighted. Even though it's cracked, the crack was made beautiful with gold and it was a beautiful piece of art. And the gold had made his cup even more precious. And so the Japanese art of kintsugi was developed and it's founded on the concept that precious things should not be thrown away just because they are broken. We must work to mend them and make them even more precious by mending them with gold. And I think that's how God mends us when we are broken. He takes our pieces and he mends us and puts us back together with the gold of his love. And that gold has got different parts in the alloy, I think. One of the ways that God mends us is with his total acceptance. Because when we've made a mess and he just says, hey, come here anyway, I love you, bring me your pieces, we know he totally <coughs> accepts us no matter what mess we've made of our lives. Maybe even if we're Zacchaeus or the woman caught at the well or the woman about to be stoned for adultery, we see that acceptance of Jesus totally transforms the situation, totally transforms the relationships and their lives and opens up a whole new world for them of loving and sharing kind relationships. So accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you. Why, it says in Romans, in order to bring praise to God. When we accept each other the way that God has accepted us, people praise God for that. And it's hard to accept people. Sometimes they're really difficult to, to embrace and welcome. And I found that when I find that really hard, when I look at them through God's eyes and see them the way God sees them, then it's very easy to accept them warmly and lovingly and see them as a beautiful person created by God. Another way we can mend with uh, gold, another way that God mends us is through his forgiveness. And we can take part in this as well. So God gives us his forgiveness to mend us with gold because forgiveness is an incredible way of healing and mending broken relationships. Even when we intentionally break his wise and loving commands and we see Jesus reaching out to a broken man a desperate young man, a paralytic, whose life is broken, his body is broken, his heart is broken, and he's almost given up on life. And in that moment, Jesus says, I forgive you, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus heals his mind, his heart, his body with the gold of his love, with the gold of his forgiveness. So be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as how 
just as Christ has forgiven you. It's not always easy to forgive. Some things are so big and sometimes our teacups are so broken, it's hard to find all the pieces and see where they're gonna fit. And it often feels easier to dump the whole lot in a bin and start again. It's often in our families where there is the deepest love that we can cause the deepest hurt and make the biggest cracks. But when we do find the way to forgive each other with the help of God and mend those cracks with loving forgiveness, we create a beautiful relational kintsugi, something precious, remended with gold. And when our hearts are breaking, another way that God mends us with gold is through his comfort. And he holds us close to his heart so we can hear his heart beating with his love for us. And we see Jesus comforting, Jesus weeping with those who are bereaved. And Paul says, mourn with those who mourn. It is a beautiful rule for us, a beautiful guide for our life that when we find someone who's sad, just go, go be sad with them. Just weep with them. Just show them God's love through your comforting presence and know that God cries too when we are hurting. And this is the kind of mending that God calls us to do in the lives of the broken people and families all around us. And I wonder, instead of looking for the perfect family, maybe we should search for the family that has done the best job of mending with gold. The story of the family that we heard in our scripture reading, a nameless father with the two nameless sons, And if there ever was a family that was badly broken, this one was, the one with the prodigal father and the welcoming, the the prodigal son and the welcoming father. We don't know if there was a mother. Maybe she was already dead. Maybe the father was a single parent struggling to do his best. But what we do know is their son was an inconsiderate, selfish rebel. Because imagine forcing your dad to sell a family business just so you can have your inheritance early and then just waste it. Waste it on parties and frivolous things that do not last at all. And then you're so homeless and penniless that you have to go and look after pigs. And you're so extremely hungry, you're jealous of their food. And you're wiping the dust off the corn husks and chewing them for breakfast and lunch. And then you remember that your dad is an amazing employer, that he cared for everyone in his household, from the smallest cheeky boy to the oldest man who could hardly work anymore. They were always well fed, they were always warmly clothed. And so you make the painful journey home because you sold your sandals for a loaf of stale bread and you've no idea what kind of welcome you are going to get when you arrive at this house, but there's nowhere else to go. You are broken, you are filthy, you are smelling, you're starving, you're weak, you're ashamed, and you are totally vulnerable. But amazingly, your dad is the best dad ever and he's been looking out for you every single day since you left. And he sees you trudging wearily along that lane carrying all your brokenness and his heart breaks for you and he runs towards you and he just wants to mend all your broken places with the precious gold of his love for you and the first thing he does is he pours warm and loving total acceptance all over you in spite of the terrible mistakes you've made you know that he has accepted you he has welcomed you back into his heart and he comforts you with his huge and delighted hug And through his respect for you, he covers your dirt and your rags with a brand new outfit before anyone else can see the damage that life has done to your body and to your dignity. And when he puts that gold ring on your finger, you know that you have been totally forgiven and your father-child relationship has been restored, mended literally with gold. And all of this is out of the ultimate loving kindness and mercy, a deep desire to heal heal all the brokenness in your life with his gold and create a relationship with you that is even more precious than ever before. And that's what God wants to do too. He wants us to work with him, to mend our relationships with gold, with his love and acceptance, with his forgiveness and comfort, and his respect and his kindness that we've experienced from him. And it's not easy. I know that. In my work as a family therapist, I've seen many families who find it really hard to fit all the pieces and find them and pick them up and put them back together again. And there are times when it seems like the only way forward is to put it all in a bin, buy another teacup and take better care of it next time. But I also know the incredible joy of the families who do work hard to pick up the pieces and over time carefully mend each crack with gold, lovingly 
listening, understanding, caring, forgiving, developing kindness again, and finding a better way to move forward. Oh, I've just been handed another envelope. On the outside it says the Best Family Ever Award. Hmm, I wonder who this could be. Bit of a drum roll, bit of a trumpet fanfare, and the winner is, let me see, let's hope it's not an Oscar fail, it's the family of God. It's the family of God. This award is actually for us, all of us, because we are in God's family, and because God is the best father and mother ever, and it's not about us being perfect, or even being the perfect family. It's about picking up the broken pieces of our lives and our families, and working with his love and his acceptance, and his forgiveness, his comfort and kindness to mend them with the purest gold of his love. So, congratulations everybody. This award is for you. This award is for us, because we're part of the best family ever. And so today, I wonder what relationships in your life are broken, or chipped, or just a little bit cracked, And I wonder how you can take the initiative to pick up some of those pieces, find where they fit, put them together, and mend them with gold, mend them with forgiveness and acceptance and comfort and all the beautiful things that we have received from God's love. And mend those precious relationships and make them even more precious. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for mending all of our relationships, our relationship with you and our relationships with each other, with the gold of your love and kindness and forgiveness. Help us to bring all the pieces of our broken hearts and relationships to you, the Kintsugi relationship expert, so that we can work together to mend them and make them even more precious. In Jesus' name, amen. Your